So far in this course, you've learned all the essential basic skills to web development. You've learned about the internet, you've been introduced to HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and even backend scripting. And if you did the last project, you were able to work on an email widget that combined all these skills and knowledge um, and showed how they work together to create a, a widget that would allow people to email you on all the different pages in your site. So you may have noticed that it took a lot of time and effort to develop each individual page and you have to, um, even if we implement the principle of DRY, don't repeat yourself, there's still a lot of extra coding that you have to do for each page and it's just going to take a lot of effort and you probably don't want to be spending that much time developing your website. You want to be spending that much time developing your content. As we mentioned at the beginning, the content is the most important thing. That's what it's all about. So what we use is a content management system that kind of does all this for you. And in specific, we're going to look at WordPress. So as you've been going along, you probably are taking one of two routes. You're probably either going in depth on each of these concepts, learning more about HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. You're probably doing all of the optional homework and really putting a lot of effort into your project, putting a lot of effort into the projects. Um, or you're taking the other route where you just are trying to get the bare minimum in order to get a website launched and running and you don't necessarily care about learning all these details and learning how to program and code and learning how to get into the nitty gritty of all of it. You just want to be able to manage and run a website and you don't necessarily have the time to uh, customize things and and get really in depth in in the knowledge so either of those roads are totally fine and WordPress is uh, you may think of it as something that because it manages it for you is kind of like uh, that second route the like easier bare minimum route but it's not actually true WordPress you can do the same thing you can take either route you can either just get the setup and have your website up and running and uh, without much expertise or knowledge or going in depth or learning coding just start doing it or you can really go in depth and you can customize you can get into all the different aspects the plugins the themes you can start developing your own themes and you can make wordpress do almost anything you want in fact there are probably a lot of websites that you've been using that you never even realized were actually based on wordpress as the core and they've been customized to the point that they're not even recognizable as wordpress so before we get into um, the actual introduction to WordPress, let's um, look at a little bit of how all of these skills that we're using work together in an actual environment where you're downloading and viewing a page from the internet. And we'll kind of see some of the motivation for why you need a content management system. So when you download a page, you put in the URL and that URL directs to the server and tells the server which file to send you. And usually uh, the process goes something like this. The server will be sending you an HTML file because that's what you've requested. And uh, the browser will start reading that HTML file top to bottom. It reads the entire thing starting at the very top, just the same way we read left to right, top to bottom. And um, as it goes through, it will eventually run into something like your CSS link element, which is a reference to your external CSS file. Um, so your CSS file is not actually in that HTML, it's separate. So when it gets to that line in your document, it's going to send another HTTP request to the server and ask for that CSS file. So it'll continue reading and it'll find maybe a JavaScript reference and it'll send an HTTP request to the server asking for that. And it'll keep going along and find all these references. It's much faster for the browser to read through the entire web page than it is for these HTTP requests to go through. So while this is all happening, the server gets these requests, starting with that CSS one, finds the CSS file, and then sends that down the line. Then it, it's also getting the request for the, the script file, finds that file, and then sends you it down You can see to the this browser. in action on your own web page using the developer tools. For example, on Mac, Option Command I for Chrome brings up the developer tools and you normally have these uh, DOM inspect stuff on the elements tab but you can move over to the network tab and this will show you information about the HTTP requests and all other network activity that's going on. So the first thing you'll need to do is reload the page so that it can capture that. Go to your own web page and try this out. Once you refresh 
the list of things that come up starts with the main HTML file for your page. Obviously, that's the first thing that gets requested. And you can see here there's a chart of when that request was made. This is at time zero. And then how long it took for the, uh, for the browser to connect to the server to send whatever it's sending, in this case an HTTP request asking for the HTML file, and then waiting for the server to go ahead and find that HTTP find the location that the HTTP request is looking for, and then uh, if there's any scripting in it, for example, execute that script. And then the receiving is the downloading. So in this case, because it's an HTML file and very small, it only took one millisecond to download the HTML file. However, it took 142 milliseconds, still a short amount of time, but a little bit longer than it took to download, for the server to find the file and begin sending it. So you can see that there are a couple uh, included um, other files in this page. You have the HTML file, you have the style sheet, the JavaScript, and then an image. Now look at the style sheet and the JavaScript. They began the HTTP requests only after the HTML was done being downloaded and loaded. That's because the browser found the references to both of these and in parallel started an HTTP, HTTP request um, asking the server for these two files. Now you'll notice over here the status. These numbers are the HTTP response code. So 200 means that it got it okay. 304 is a response code that means the browser already has it in the cache and the one on the server is not different. It's the same version that you have in the browser's cache, so it doesn't download it. So if you hover over these, you'll see that while there's some time maybe to connect and wait for the server, it won't actually be downloading them again because they already exist. So in this case, it was two milliseconds to receive the HTTP response code, and in this case, zero milliseconds to receive the JavaScript HTTP response code. Now, if we want to get a clean slate to see what it would look like to download all of this the first time you visit the page, you have to hold shift when you hit refresh. And that will tell it to get new copies of everything no matter what. It's basically like clearing the cache. So hold shift and click refresh. And you'll see that it took a little bit longer. The times changed. So it still took about 350 milliseconds from start to finish to get the HTML file. Once it had gotten the HTML file, it got the CSS and the JavaScript in parallel, started both of those HTTP requests at the same time. However, you can see that the style sheet was much smaller. It was 655 bytes versus 90 kilobytes. A kilobyte is much bigger than a byte. So the style sheet downloaded in 88 milliseconds, whereas the JavaScript file downloaded in 222 milliseconds. Actually, the style sheet downloaded in one millisecond. My, the, it, it took 88 milliseconds for the server to send it. So while these two HTTP requests, the requests were sent in parallel, the uh, JavaScript continued downloading for much longer. And then you can see that it took a while for the image to even get loaded. So the, the browser wasn't able to make that HTTP request for the image until this line was cleared up. And you can see this, this little line here indicates when the DOM is finished loading, and this indicates when the page is completely done loading. Uh, you don't have to worry about those now, but this purple line means that the browser has finished loading, uh, reading all the way through the HTML cover to cover, and it has parsed it and, and created its mental image of the page, the DOM. And that's when you start to see some of these uh, things get loaded. So you can tell if you look at this that as it gets more complicated, the HTTP requests and the dependencies become obvious. And this is a really great way to see if your page is overburdened. Another great tool in the Chrome Developer Tools package is the Timeline tab. Go over here and turn on this little recording button to begin recording, and then refresh your page holding Shift again if you want. Now this will give you an idea, and you can turn off recording after a second. This will give you an idea of how long it's taking a lot of the smaller sub-actions, and it'll show you some of the dependencies. So you can see the very first request is the send request for the HTML file. And that is expanded upon right here. There's a lot of different things that the browser does as it goes. The next request is for the CSS file, which 
triggered a couple of these other things, receiving data, finishing the loading, and then the JavaScript. And you can tell these are in parallel. And then right here, this is an interesting one, recalculate style. This shows how the browser uses the information from the style sheet after it loaded it to recalculate the way the page looked. So this is called redrawing or painting. And this is part of where that FOUC happens, the flash of unstyled content. And then here you can see where the actual JavaScript script is being evaluated. I'm going to scroll over. Right here, this is where the script is evaluated. So the script is loaded here, and then it actually gets run here. And you can see as it's parsing through, reading different things. So this, uh, this timeline tool is very powerful in that it shows you all the details of exactly what's happening. And you can collapse and expand the different parts. And as you scroll down, you'll start to see things like painting and composite layers. And this is a great way to debug if things are taking a long time. But generally, looking at the network tool, you see the things that have this a bigger area here, bigger download size. That's a problem. And then when you see things that are depending on other things, that's another problem, dependencies. But for the most part, what's going to help you is to reduce the number of HTTP requests. So that means combining all of your styles, all of your JavaScripts into one file each, and reducing the number of images that are not already loaded, and reducing this, the overall size. So you can see that in an ideal situation, the only thing that's different on each page is the content, and then maybe a little bit of information that goes in the header, like the title. Um, so you can kind of idealize a, a website structure where there's this common layout they, where every page has a shared heading, sidebar, footer, shared CSS, shared JavaScript, and that never changes. And the only thing that does change between pages is just that content. And then as you switch between pages, all you're getting is the unique content for that page. And of course, that's exactly what WordPress does. The way WordPress works is a little bit different than our static pages so far. WordPress is a server-side script, a very complicated program that lives on the server and it does a lot of things including manage some databases. Databases are kind of like you can imagine like if you've ever worked with uh, Microsoft Excel or, an, or a spreadsheet software. Databases hold all of the content of your website in these spreadsheets or databases and then WordPress is able to access, for example, the content from certain pages, pull it out of the database, and then build a page that it sends to you. So the first thing that you need to know about WordPress is that it actually takes over the URL structure of your site for the directory that it's in. So if WordPress is in the main directory, you can type yourdomain.com and then anything else, and no matter what you type, no matter what folder or file name you type, even if it doesn't exist, it'll be rerouted to WordPress and WordPress will have control of it. So what's actually happening when you type in a URL to a WordPress uh, site is you're loading the WordPress script every time. It's just that same WordPress script and what WordPress does is it looks at what files you requested and it gets that information from the database and it builds that HTML output. So you remember that scripts don't actually download, they only send the output to be downloaded. So what WordPress does is it builds the HTML file for the page you requested, and then you download that. You download the output of the PHP script that is WordPress that has compiled and put together the HTML page based on the URL that you requested. That's not all that WordPress does, however. This is one benefit of keeping your site organized, but we call it a content management system because it manages your content and because it makes it easier to create your content. If you're gonna create your content manually, you have to create all this framework and structure for each page individually. But when you use a content management system, you can log into that content management system. You can actually log into the scripts on the server. And it's sort of like when we were using Shift Edit. We were online, creating our content online, and then when we saved it, our page was uploaded. This is a little different in that you're not logging into a website that's connecting to your website through FTP, like Shift Edit was. You're logging directly into your server, directly onto scripts in your server. And so when you create a page in WordPress, 
you're actually creating it directly on your server. And WordPress will take the content of what you're writing and put it in the database, take the title and any other information about it and put it in a database. And then when that's requested later, it'll pull that information out of the database, build the HTML file and send that down to whoever requested it. So the great thing about WordPress content creation is you can actually create it without working with code directly. You don't have to focus on developing your website, you can focus on developing your content. Let's go ahead and get started creating our first WordPress installation on your servers. Now the way you're gonna do this is um, through the control panel on your server. Your server has some software installed on it um, that is called cPanel, and it's a control panel that allows you to manage your domain in a lot of ways. Um, so I'm gonna give you the, the first instructions to do that, um, but before you do that, um, a, a lot of you are gonna want to save the content that you already have on your website, because you're gonna have to decide if you want to overwrite your old content or transfer your old content into the new content, or you can even create your WordPress installation in a separate folder. But before we go any further, it's probably important that you back up your existing content, unless you just wanna erase it and start over. So follow this video if you don't want to erase your existing website completely. And this will allow you to back up your content and then you can move forward. Okay, so let's get started on project one. First, you have to log into cPanel. The control panel for your website is located on a subdomain of your domain. So the subdomain name is cPanel for control panel. So type in cPanel dot and then your domain name. Hit enter and you will come to this login screen. Now this login information that it's asking you for is the Shoutleaf account information that you were given at the beginning of the course. So go ahead and copy your username and password and log in. Now you're logged in to the control panel for your server. So be very careful when you're in here because you can break a lot of things. But you can also do some really cool things and it's pretty user friendly to be honest. It shows you some information about your site on the left here and then these are all settings that you can change, things that you can set up. Um, you can even set up backups. You can, you can create new FTP accounts and change FTP account clients. Passwords, you can create new ones. Um, there's a lot going on here. What we're gonna do right now is we are going to install WordPress using the Soft Delicious Apps Installer. The second part of your in-session project is to actually use the Soft Delicious software to install WordPress. So find that all the way at the very bottom and click on WordPress. Now this WordPress um, install gives you a bunch of information but right here, we're just gonna go ahead and click on install and kind of ignore the rest of this. So leave this uh, protocol alone. You'll, you'll have a couple options. Just leave it at HTTP. Don't put the www, otherwise it'll require www every time. And then um, you should just have one domain here. As you expand your hosting options, you could have multiple domains. Now this is uh, a part that's important. This directory, this, this says where the WordPress installation will be. So if WordPress is gonna be your main website, which I recommend, I, I do this on mine, um, don't put anything here, just leave it blank and it'll be directly in your main site. So if you go to yourdomain.com, it'll take you to the WordPress site. However, if you want WordPress to be either just like a demo or a test install, or you want it to be a, a a subcomponent of your site and not the main thing and you want the main thing to be some something else you can type anything you want like WordPress directory and what this will do is it'll install WordPress in that directory and then if you want to go to your WordPress install it has you'll have to go to your domain.com slash whatever directory you put like this and then this will take you to WordPress and if you don't put the the WordPress directory, then this will take you to whatever you've got in your folder that you've uploaded with FTP or whatever. So you have a choice here depending on if you want to overwrite your old stuff. So I'm going to install this in, um, in a special directory. I'm just going to call it WP for this example. 
I'm assuming most of you, if you've backed up your content, will probably just want to erase your old content and, and put it here. Um, by the way, this won't actually erase it. It'll just make it inaccessible. It'll still be on your server. So leave database alone. Um, you want Soft Delicious and WordPress to manage all of this database stuff for you, so just leave it alone. You can give it a name if you really want to, but I say leave it alone. Leave the table prefix alone. Now here's where you can set up some initial settings for your blog. You can change this later, but um, I'm gonna give it a name. That's the name of my website. And then there's like a little subtitle And then leave this alone. Now here's where you create a admin account. So this admin account is not the same as this Shoutleaf account. What you're creating here is your WordPress account. So when you log into your WordPress site, you're going to use this information and it's totally unrelated to your Shoutleaf account. This is your server account information. This is your WordPress account information. So don't get confused on that. And if you really want to, you can use the same username and password. However, I, I don't recommend doing that because it's just going to um, reinforce the idea that they're the same when they're not. And when if anything ever changes in the future, you're going to be super confused. So I say create a new username and password. And this username will actually be visible at times on WordPress, depending on how you set it up. So I would recommend you use a professional looking name because it, sometimes it'll be things like posted by admin or whatever is here. So I'm going to put Brenton just so that it looks like it's by me. And then here you're going to put a password and your admin email. It's important that this is your actual email address. Choose a language. Don't go into the advanced. And then you can also email the installation details to yourself and install. you should get a confirmation message telling you that it was installed properly. So you can see that there's two places that you can go. The main one here, it'll if you put the subdirectory, it'll be forward slash WP or whatever you put. I put WP. If you didn't have it installed in a particular directory, it'll just be your domain name. The administrative URL is how you log in, and that will always be WP-admin inside of whatever directory it is. So because I have WP, it's inside that subfolder, but if you didn't put it, you just put it in your main site, it'll just be yourdomain.com slash WP admin. So you don't actually have to remember this, but let's go ahead and check out my website and see what it looks like now. Now remember, I installed it in this WP directory. So here's the default WordPress install. It's got a fake little post here and a couple of links on the right that are pretty empty, even a, a sample page. The third part of your in-session project is to log into WordPress and begin customizing it. So let's log in to the admin area. So you can either scroll down and find the login in Meta. If you look down here in the bottom when I hover over it, it says wp-login.php. You can either click on this to go there or you can just type that directly in, wp-login.php, or you can do the whole wp admin thing. They'll, it'll all take you to the same place. Now here, you're going to put in the information that you set up during the installation. So this is the administration area of your WordPress site. Uh, also, people call it WordPress blog. So you are logged in now to an area that only you can see as an administrator. And this is where you can do all of the content managing and change all the settings and do basically anything you want. So on the top here is kind of a main navigation bar that'll, that'll stay on this uh, top area as long as you're logged in. Um, you can see that this is a link right here to your main site. You can open it, I'll open it in a new tab. And so this is your site again. But now that you're logged in, you've got this uh, administration bar up here that is just for you when you're logged in. And you can do things like edit the page you're on. If I click into one page, you'll see I have edit posts, stuff like that. So, um, and then you have links back to all these different areas. So back to the uh, administration area. 
you've got initially a dashboard that just has some information about your site and some uh, quick snapshots of different areas. And then on the left here is the main uh, navigation panel, which has all of the uh, things that you'll be using to customize and build your site. Right off the bat, the most important things are posts and pages. So these are very similar. They're, they're ways of creating content, creating pages, but posts are like blog posts and pages are like web pages. So the difference is a post will go in your blog and it's kind of tied to a specific date. So initially when you create a post, it'll, it'll, the title of the post will probably be something like the current date, um, the URL that it creates. Now a page on the other hand is meant to always be available and it doesn't kind of like get old with time. It's something that's always there. So on most WordPress blogs, you have like a blog section. This is, this is actually a post. And then you have pages which are like part of the main navigation. So let's go ahead and create a post and a page to kind of illustrate the difference there. So you can either click directly on add new or go into this pages area and then you'll see a list of all your pages. Right now it's just sample page. You can see that one sample page there. Now sample page is different than hello world. So this sample page, I'm going to create a new one. The only two things you really need to give it are a title and some content. This is the content area here. There's two tabs. I'm using the visual tab, which means I don't have to write any HTML. If I want to make something bold or italic, I can use this button here and it'll italicize it without me needing to write the code. Now, if I want to actually have a little bit more control and power, you can go to the text editor here and you'll see that it's actually the HTML editor. I can go in and uh, edit the HTML specifically. But still, WordPress gives you a, a little bit of help, which can be annoying sometimes. For example, if I put a line break and start a new paragraph, WordPress will automatically go into your code and it'll wrap a paragraph tag around this and a paragraph tag around this because you put the two line breaks. So it's really user friendly, but it can be too user friendly if you're not expecting it to go in and mess with your code. So you have to be aware that WordPress will actually change this HTML text even though it doesn't look like it is. So for really quick posts and quick content, this can be super easy, but if you're trying to do things a little bit more complicated, um, it can be frustrating and there are a couple of workarounds that um, I can show you later. But anyway, let's go ahead and publish this. And then once you've published it, this button will change to update. So when you make edits, you have to click update. And you can see here, this is the link to the page. It automatically created a URL to it. Um, but also, if I go to my site and refresh, it should show up in the navigation area. So this is my first WordPress page. And here is the uh, page that I created. Now, again, the page is different than the blog post. So this hello world, this is a blog post. Now, by default in WordPress, your homepage is your blog, and your blog will show just a list of all of your blog posts. So right now, I just have one, this one that was default created by WordPress, Hello World. So let's go in and create a new blog post. I'm gonna click on Posts, and you can see my one existing blog post that was created by WordPress as a demo. I'm gonna create a new post, and a post is different than a page, And same, same format here, it's almost exactly the same. Um, you have text editing or visual editing, um, and then you publish right here, and it'll turn to update once you've published if you wanna edit it. So now if I refresh on my homepage, the navigation doesn't change because this is not a page I just added, it's a post. And it pushed hello world down and moved up to post. So I can, click into a particular post by clicking on one of these and then I can see just that post and you see I don't have hello world down there anymore and then I have the navigation pages up here let's go back to the dashboard so right away the first thing that I will have usually do when I install is I'll go into settings and I'll go to um, I'll go to permalinks down at the bottom here. So this is all that information I set to begin with, that's general. Down at permalinks, this is how your pages get created. 
So note that the URL for the first post I made is question mark p equals six. And the, the URL for my page that I created here is page ID equals four. Now if you wanna have nicer, prettier looking uh, links, the way to do that is right in here. So you can pick one of these options, um, something like post name is a good way to do it. But post, post name on its own may not be enough because um, you may have lots of posts that sometimes will have the same name, the same title, and then P WordPress will have to differentiate between them. That can get confusing. So another way to do that is to do day and name or month and name. Um, I, I tend to think that um, just having the month, the year and the month and then the name is enough, even if even maybe just like the year and the name, but you can see as I click on these different things, it updates the custom structure here. So there's this syntax. This means year, this means month number, this means post name. So I can kind of like mess with this if I want. But I tend to like to have post name at the end. There are some performance reasons that you don't want post name to be at the beginning. So it's good to, this is probably the best one, is just a uh, month and name. So you get somewhat pretty links, but it's also divided by the um, month. Now when you save changes, there we go. So the pages will not have that uh, month and year name in them, but the posts will, which, which is totally fine to me because your posts are tied to a date anyway. So your blog posts will always start with 2013, whatever month it is, and then the name, whereas your pages will just have the straight up page name. So this is our first step to turning it from more of a blog to a page. So the next step is, what if you don't want your list of posts to be on your homepage, you want it to have an actual page? Now there's a setting for that too. You go into reading, and right now the front page displays your latest posts. We can change that by having the front page be a static page. Now we'll probably want to create the, a, a specific page to be our home page. maybe call it home. Um, right now I could set it to this, and then you have to set a posts page to, to take over your blog section. So before we do this, I'm gonna go ahead and create two new pages for that. So add new, I'm gonna make a home page, and I'm gonna update this later. And then I'm gonna create a blog page. And I'm just gonna leave this empty. So now that I've got, let's look at our list of pages. So now I've got the sample page that WordPress made for me, the one we made together just now, and then a home page, which I'll expand later, and a blog page, which is empty. And the reason we want that empty blog page is because we're gonna go into settings and reading, and now we're gonna set the front page to be home, and we'll expand this later, and then the posts page will just be blog. And now when we save this, and we can have some settings here. So this shows like the, the most 10 recent posts. If you've got a thousand blog posts, you don't want to show all thousand. So this is how many you show on the blog page. And then you can either show the full text or if you have long posts, you probably just want to put a short summary. It'll put like the first few paragraphs. Now that we've saved the setting, if we come back here and refresh, we'll see a couple of changes. So our home page now is just whatever we put in that page. We can expand on this later, my home page. And then if we want to see our blog posts, we can go to blog, and then here we see the list of our two posts that have been updated here. And then in the other pages. So this is a pretty well working website right now. But what if you want to edit it and make it look a little bit better? That's where themes come in. Everything in this appearance tab, this is where you have control to really change things up. So right now, if I go to appearance, it'll take me to themes first, and we'll see that I'm using the 2012 theme. I could also switch to the 2011 theme. Um, pretty soon there'll be the 2013 theme, I assume, since they make one every year. So there are options within your theme to change the menus, the header, the background, or to change to a completely different theme, or you can find a new theme. So let's switch to the 2011 theme since it's already installed by default. All you have to do is click activate and it's activated. New theme activated and now you can see that 2011 is the current theme and down here 2012 is still available. 
So now when I come here and refresh, the entire way that this looks, the theme will change. Now it's a totally different site, right? But it's the exact same content, all the same posts, home is still here. And that page that I made, this is my first WordPress page, is still here. So <clears throat> you can see how you, you got a lot of power here in separating the content and the presentation. Now let's install our own theme, a new theme. We can either look for it based on keyword or based on some of these. Um, I like to maybe find a tree theme, a theme that has a tree in it. Only two results. Maybe find a theme that's got the color blue. 32 results. Now you can kind of see little demos. Here, this one's nice and fun. Now you can either just install or preview first. The preview will give you a little preview of what the page actually will look like. So I like this one. I'm going to install it. Now that I've installed it, I can either activate it or go back to our theme installer. So activate will actually turn it on, or if you don't activate it, then in your manage themes, you'll still have this one that's the current one, which is this one. But now down at the bottom, you'll have this one too, which you've installed. And here you can activate it. So new, new theme activated, and then just refresh. Now I've got this very cool blue rainbow sky theme going on with flat leaves and everything. So it's really easy to find themes. And I'll give you a little hint is that this install themes search, what it's actually doing is it's searching wordpress.org, the themes section right here. So there are 1,732 themes currently on the WordPress themes directory. And you can look through the most popular ones um, or just find your own. So here's a cool one. If you're installing from wordpress.org though, they're assuming that you're gonna download it and then upload it and then install it. So even if you find it here, the best way to go about installing is probably to get the name of it and then go over to your install your appearance and then install themes and then the search and then paste the name of it and search for it and then you can find it here and then when you install it and activate it from here you don't have to do any manual downloading so here is my other theme that I just installed Ooh, I like this one you can see that if I change the size of this it kind of changes a little bit this seems to be a somewhat responsive theme the menu collapsed in here when I made it small, and then as I expand it, uh, it uh, expands out here. So this is a responsive theme. You wanna make sure that you've got a theme that responds like that, because the size of a phone is gonna be more like this, and it's gonna break your page if it's trying to display like this. Continuing our survey, let's reactivate this plugin, this theme, because it has a more obvious sidebar. And you can see it's a little bit cluttered. There's a lot of stuff here. So we want to get rid of some of these little things. The place for that is the next little item inside appearance is the widgets. Now here's all of these different widgets. You have search, recent posts, recent comments that corresponds to search, recent posts, recent comments, etc. So let's get rid of archives and categories because we don't want those right now. Move them out of the way. And then we can refresh and you can see this is simplified a little bit. And now let's add a couple of uh, widgets. Let's add a calendar. And then down here, let's find the arbitrary text and add that down at the bottom. And you can actually put anything you want in here, including HTML. So you see the calendar has popped in here. And then if we scroll down, here's the arbitrary text I put with HTML that I put right in there. The next cool thing is menus. So you may want to customize your menu a little bit. 
If you just go with default, any page that you create as opposed to a post, any page you create will show up in this menu here. So that means we created a blog page, we created a home page, and what if we want to either change the order or we want some of these not to show up? Say for example we want to keep this, this is my first WordPress page, but we don't want it to always show up in the menu, and we want home page to be first. That's where you come in here with the menu section under appearances. So the first thing you'll do is create a menu. You have to give it a name and then you can create it. After you've created it, in this themes locations, you have to select it and save it. So now it's active in your theme. And this is where you can enter custom links into your menu. Most of the time though, you're just gonna wanna draw from your existing pages. So go to view all and this is all of your pages. Or if you just wanna, if you have a massive amount, you can search for them but this should be enough. Now, as you check these one at a time, it'll add them to the menu. Now, this order matters. So if I were to save it right now, you'll see blog, home, sample page, and this is my first WordPress page. That's the order, blog, home, sample page, this is my first WordPress page. So let's change the order up the way we want it. And then say I wanted to get rid of this is my first WordPress page. I could have either not added it or now that I have added it, I want to remove it, click here. So now I've just got these three in my menu, home, blog, sample page. And say I want to put blog last. So you can really customize your menu exactly the way you want. You can also play with categories, but I'll leave you to figure that out on your own. The last thing is the editor inside the appearance section, and this is the most advanced. So when you go to the editor initially, it's gonna show you all of the files in your theme. So I'm using the cloudy blue sky theme, and all of these files are all theme files. Now it's gonna give me the style sheet, style.css first, because that's probably what you're gonna be editing. So if I wanted to change things in here, the way I would do it is by going to the editor and editing this style.css. This is the CSS file right here, and since you've learned some CSS, you shouldn't be afraid of making changes in here. Even though it's a huge wall of text, you can figure it out slowly, especially using the techniques you learn. Say I wanted to change the size of this subheading here. I can use my inspect element tool, and then find the subheading, and I can see that it's using this .header.desc, probably stands for description. And I can test in here what size I want it to be. That seems like a good size. So now I can see right here that this is style.css. That's the same one I was just editing. So I have to remember .header.desc. I'm going to go into my style sheet and search for that. And I can see it shows up one time, one of one. So I know this is the right place. And here I can add in the CSS that I want to. And I can save it. And now, even if I undo this, if I refresh, you'll see that the, si that the size is updated. There it is. So this is how you customize your page. And you can get into really advanced stuff, like this is the header, which will be about this area here. This is where you can get into the HTML on the PHP to modify that. The last thing that you need to get introduced to for WordPress is plugins. Plugins are where everything really happens. You can find plugins to extend your site to do almost anything you want. To start with, let's add a simple one that'll track your visitors. You go to Add New, and then type the name of the plugin you're looking for. In this case, Google Analyticator. Now you'll need to set up a Google Analytics account in order to get this to work, but I'll walk you through that process because it's worth it. Google Analyticator, install now. Yes, install. And then once it's gone through, activate the plugin. Now you see it down here. Go to the settings. You'll need to be logged into your Google account. Um, go ahead and click on the link that they give you and allow access. Copy the code they give you into the box and continue. Now initially it'll be disabled and there'll be a 403 error. So what you need to do is actually go in if this is what the message you get, which you probably will, is you need to go into Google and set up a Google Analytics account. 
So go to google.com slash analytics and make sure that you're signed in and here's the sign up process. You're going to be doing this for a website. Go ahead and pick one of these. I'm going to go with Universal and enter your website information. You have to accept the terms of service and then your account should be set up. Go back to your page and refresh. This time that error goes away so you can click enabled. Now just go ahead and scroll down. You can mess with these later although you probably don't need to change anything. Scroll to the bottom and save. Now it should be set up. To see the tracking, go to your dashboard and find the Google Analytics page here. I like to put it on the right because often the right is a little bit larger and I like to drag it up to the top. A lot of these are not really that useful. So right now you'll have nothing, but over time you'll see a chart of the number of visitors, page views, visits, bounce rate, and other useful data. So that is the end of the high-level survey of WordPress. It should be enough for you to get started, although you can spend many years learning everything there is to know about WordPress. Just skimming the surface, you'll be able to get into a lot of really powerful stuff looking through, especially the plugins, because you can extend it to all kinds of things. Image galleries, contact forms, there's an endless list of thousands of plugins that people have created. Probably the easiest way to find the plugins is not through the plugin finder here, but actually go to wordpress.org and then click on the plugins link and this will show you both the most popular links and the featured plugins. Featured plugins are ones that WordPress has featured because they think they're especially useful. And the most popular plugins are used by millions of people sometimes and have uh, good ratings and for the most part are going to be a good bet that a lot of people have found them very, very helpful. So go to WordPress.org and check out the popular plugins. And then you can also search by the uh, category of plugin as well. The other thing you'll want to do right away is pick a theme and then start customizing it. So find a theme that is similar to the way you want it to look. Start using the skills that you learned in this course using the DOM inspector and your CSS editing skills to edit your theme and make it look more precisely the way you want. The first stop to customizing a theme is the options in the theme right here. So some, uh, some themes have more options than others. And then if you can't get it to way, look quite the way you want with these options, then you go into the editor and start customizing things by hand. That is the end of this lesson. Um, go ahead and get started on the project and uh, let me know how things go.